Hi there, it's Kim Lucard, Hockey Mom RD, and today I'm going to show you a quick and easy recipe for a vegetarian enchilada crock pot recipe. It takes four to six hours to cook in the crock pot, so you could put it on, you know, late morning uh, or at lunchtime, and it'll be ready uh, for dinner. This would not be good for a pre practice meal because, as you'll see, it's kind of spicy and it does have some fiber in it. So, first, you're going to use one can of black beans and one can of corn rinsed. You can, all, you can use frozen corn if you like. One cup of uncooked quinoa. A half a cup of water. One can of roasted red peppers and chilies. and a half a can of your enchilada sauce. Now you're going to want to stir all that together. Go ahead and add the rest of your enchilada sauce. You can really add your enchilada sauce all at one time. And then you are going to top the dish with about one cup of grated, uh, it could be the taco cheese or the four cheese Mexican cheese. So you have a nice flavor. Um, I get the pre-shredded cheese, it just makes my life easier. Then you are going to plug it in. If you are cooking it on low, depending on your crock pot, uh, low on my crock pot takes about six hours, high will take about five. And I'll be back to show you the finished product. About two hours into cooking on high, you'll really start to see the cheese uh, melting and your house will become quite flavorful. And now it's finished. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Stefan Fleur from Campeo Tab. Hi, I'm Fredrik Juring from Mariko. Welcome, Welcome to Sunning Academy. Wrist shot, forehand. Hit the ball in between the legs and close to your body. Let the blade slide along the floor. Note that more pressure against the floor increases power and speed of the wrist shot. The stick actually adds a lot of speed and power to your shot. When you're shooting, if you lean into the shot, you will load the stick, putting energy into the shaft, which is then transferred to the ball when you release your shot. Your follow-through is very important. When you follow through, you're essentially aiming where the ball is going. Tip 1. Added power can be gained from a twitch of the blade when the stick is pulled back, and then twitching back when releasing the shot. Tip 2. You can generate a lot of flex on your stick by buying the stick with the appropriate flex, which depends on your weight and size. Sweeper, forehand. When taking a sweeper shot, the ball should be drawn back behind your leg. Think of it as throwing a ball. In order to get more power, you want to pull it back so you can get a lot of power. Weight transfer increases the shooting power. When you begin the shot, the weight is almost evenly distributed. When taking the shot, you should move almost all weight to the front leg and push off with your back and front leg, thus putting more power and energy into your sweeper shot. At the start of the sweeper, the ball should be located at the heel or close to it of the blade. While you're executing the sweeper, the ball will roll forward toward the toe of your blade. This will give the ball a spin and also allow you to aim where you want to shoot. Your follow through is very important. When you follow through, you're essentially aiming where the ball is going. Tip: Use your whole body to follow through. Don't forget to lift your head and look where the goal is. Slap shot. Move all of your weight from your back leg to front leg in one fluid motion. The idea is to shift your weight in the direction of the shot. This puts more energy and power into your slap shot. Straight arms in the backswing will help you to avoid high sticking. Make sure you do not exceed the waist limit in your backswing. 
Beginners often try to hit the ball directly. This is not the proper way to hit a slap shot. Instead, make sure you hit the floor 10 to 15 centimeters before the ball. This allows you to load or flex the stick first. Loading the stick is where a lot of power in your slap shot comes from. Tip. It is better to be accurate than to shoot for 180 kilometers per hour. You'll never score a goal if you do not hit the net. Outsweeper. Hold your chin up and try to locate the net. A quick upper body rotation increases the power of the shot. Do not be afraid to flex your weight on your stick, which will give you extra energy and power to your outsweeper. Make sure your upper body is rotating enough so you're not only using your arms when shooting. Turn up toward the net and strengthen the motion by pointing your stick towards the net, assuring your shot has the right direction. Insweeper. This shot is a combination of shooting feint and a sweeper shoot in one fluid motion, also called toe drag. Very useful when you have a defender in front of you or when having a penalty shot and you would like to shoot beside the defending wall. Tip. The more curve motion you can get, the more power you will get when shooting. Spinner, forehand. This shot is used when you're positioned in the box standing with your back toward the net. Rotate and fire away the shot. Do not be afraid to flex your weight on your stick, which will give you extra energy and power to your spinner. Volley, two-handed, forehand. It's easiest to hit the ball exactly on half volley at the moment it bounces, but being able to hit on volley gives you a great advantage in front of the net. Tip. Straight arms and backswing will help you avoid high sticking. Make sure you do not exceed the waist limit in your backswing. Volley. Two-handed. Backhand. It's easiest to hit the ball exactly on half volley at the moment it bounces, but being able to hit on volley gives you a great advantage in front of the net. Tip. Straight arms in your backswing will help you to avoid high sticking. Make sure you do not exceed the waist limit in your backswing. Knocker. Backhand. A powerful backhand shot gives you more opportunities to score goals. You'll not always have time to switch to forehand and shoot. When you want to hit a knocker, protect the ball on your side. Take it to out and knock it off. The blade should hit the ball under the ball. Vary the angle of the blade in order to get different height with this shot. You want to hit the ball somewhere in between the heel and the middle of the blade, the flat spot. Backhand Sweeper Sometimes a quick forehand to backhand deke is the perfect way to beat a goalie. A player with a good backhand shot will be able to shoot the ball over the goalie's legs, top shelf, and score more goals. The first step is to draw the ball back in your stance to the leg furthest from the net. When hitting a backhand sweeper, you want the ball to start between the middle and the heel of your stick blade. Remember to also transfer your weight into the shot. You want to move your weight in the direction of the shot. This will give you more power. Do not forget, your leg push-off really adds a lot of power to the backhand sweeper. Release the ball from the middle of the blade. Tip. With a powerful backhand, you'll also roll your hands over to aim the shot, sort of like a snap and roll combined. Crusher. Backhand. The backhand crusher is a difficult shot for both the defender and the goalie, as it's quick and unpredictable. Frederick smacks the ball at an angle from above. The pressure you will get will lift the ball up and fire it away. The shot is hard and often surprising. Trust me on the science of this program in that the more you perform these off-ice actions, 
the more they'll transfer to your on ice or roller hockey game. Lastly, I purposely film most of the following exercises in a small area of our office. The reason I wanted you to appreciate how little space is needed and that there should be very little in the way of your achieving incredible stick handling skills. Soft hands are important to puck handling. So, go slowly at first and just practice tossing and catching your own pass softly with a stick cup slightly over the ball. Again, the purpose is to develop that soft cupping action. The next thing a good puck handler needs is quick hands. So, do this close, side to side drip. Start out slowly at first, but eventually try really moving those hands. Go as fast as possible for just a few seconds and then rest a little before trying it again. In my classes, I usually call this form of training puck handling because it doesn't just involve handling the puck with one stick. So, try this one and get so that you can really motor that ball. This exercise teaches you to have a feel for tapping the puck ahead, and it also helps you quickly find and control a lost puck. The idea is to dribble, spin one way, and find the puck. Dribble, spin the other way, and find the puck again. This is a great drill for softening the hands and learning to handle the puck in numerous ways. Place your gloves or other obstacles out in front of your toes and then attempt to trace a figure eight in one direction at first, then in the other direction. To get the most from this exercise, try doing it without moving any more than your arms and hands. Hockey requires us to handle the puck while dealing with lots of other problems. So, we can recreate such challenges by moving our body in numerous ways while also dribbling a puck along. Just hop and dribble and keep switching feet. Eventually, try to keep the hands and ball moving as your feet change. Now let's look at those uh, different acceleration uh, with, with a timer. So what we're going to do is, like we, what we do with research, we, we measure acceleration with 20 feet or about 6 meters. And we're going to do four different types of accelerations that are typically used in uh, skating instructional programs. We're going to do a, a crossover hop. We're going to do a running start. We're going to do a, a start from a, from a, a, a T position or a T start. And then we're just going to do a normal push and go start. So I'm going to go, then Nolan's going to go, and we're going to try all four of them, and we're going to see which one is faster so that we can prove to you objectively that the last one that we've talked about is just pushing and going, not hopping, not running, and not, certainly not starting from a T position like this is a faster way. So Nolan and I are going to go one at a time, and the first one we're going to, going to do is the hop, the crossover hop. So we're starting here, and and crossing over and then a little bit of a run and let's see what time I did there so I was 1.56 and when Nolan goes whenever you're ready Nolan so Nolan Nolan's time was 1.53
Now the next one is going to be a running start. So you'll see this a lot of in some instructional programs. They'll sometimes put sticks there and you gotta run over the sticks. So let's see what time we can get when we're running this time, Nolan, okay? So you're on your toes and you're running as fast as you can. And we'll see what time I got on that. 1.55. And let's see what Nolan can do when he's running. That was a nice little run, Nolan. That was good. 1.42. With your heels together and both sticks, both hands on the ice, or both hands on the stick, and then starting from here. So let's see what we can do here. All right, take a look what I did here. 1.40. All right, Nolan, let's see what you can do, buddy. Heels together, that's it. And Nolan was 1.50. And now let's check the last acceleration out. So this one is just a normal push and go. Uh, not hopping, not, uh, no, not, our heels aren't moving together. We're just gonna push and go and we'll see how, how we do on this one. All right, let's see what I did on that one now. 1.24. So that was, that was a little bit faster. Now let's see what Nolan does with that normal push and go. Fast feet, that's it Nolan, that was good, right on. And Nolan's got 1.37. Now I know you saw the, uh, the times on the camera and I know that you uh, heard them when we, I was calling them out, but I just wanted to go over these again uh, like we did a, would do in a research uh, setting just to make it a little bit more objective. So when I did the crossover, my time was 1.56. When Nolan did the crossover, his time was 1.53. When we did the running start, my time was 1.55, Nolan was 1.43. The T start with our heels together, I was 1.40, and Nolan was 1.50. But, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. When we did just the push and go with your feet apart in a good ready position, uh, quick feet, quick acceleration, three strides, my time was 1.24. So that's almost a quarter of a second faster than, than the rest of them. And Nolan's was 1.37. So the, the point here is this, that, that running crossover and hopping up and down, running up and down, and having your feet together are actually slower ways of accelerating than just being in the ready position and having three quick strides. Dennis Chigas Olens the nature of our game, ranks with other high-level essays, authored by the likes of Gladwell, Percival, and Coyle. It's an in-depth study of our game, it's about the challenges players face in the heat of battle, and it's about the things that influence the way players need to train, both off, and on the ice. Get it now, and be well armed, to answer almost any question, that arises about our game. Schmitz, resistancebandtrain.com, finishing out some assisted rollouts that are a lot of fun to do. Unfortunately, I'm not real good at them. So what do I do? I bring in a band for assistance. Yeah, by going ahead, hooking a band up in a little bit higher position, and then having multiple levels of resistance, or in this case, assistance, you can go ahead and anybody can go ahead and do rollouts. Rollouts are a great way to go ahead and dynamically train your trunk to be a better stabilizer. You know, by putting yourself in that prone position, we're essentially teaching ourselves how to control extension. So it's kind of an anti-extension exercise, if you will, but it's also gonna help with your push-ups, it's gonna help with any kind of pushing movements you have, and obviously anything that helps develop or get stronger because of our better core stability is gonna be a great way to go ahead and use this exercise to enhance those exercises. Let me show you how to go ahead and set it up. It's real simple. Again, we've got three levels of bands. I recommend you always have different levels so you can challenge yourself differently. 
I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take a black medium resistance. You just saw me using the purple, but I'm gonna go with the black medium because that's about where I, I'm at and then I can still challenge myself. Now the goal here is the ultimately to be able to do these without the assistance, but hey, in time that'll come. You got your rollout ready to go, you got your feet set. Now the key will be to make sure you're letting your hips go down with you, not let the band keep your hips up. If your hips are staying too high, you're gonna go ahead and run into trouble because you're not getting that full extension. You really wanna feel your trunk really being lengthened out. So I'm in this position, I've got my feet out, I'm gonna drop down, control, and then pull my trunk back up. So again, I wanna drop all the way down, flatten out, and then come back up. Now the black band is a little bit harder for me because it doesn't give me that much assistance. But here's a really cool idea. If you step out a little bit further, start the exercise at a little bit higher position, now you're gonna get more resist assistance and you might be able to use the black band to go ahead and assist you with this exercise. If not, no big deal. Go ahead, pop yourself into the purple band, use more assistance, and go ahead and do that. The key is though, make sure you're getting some number enough repetitions. You know, if you're only able to do like one or two repetitions, that's not enough. You wanna be able to go ahead, hit sets of 10, hit sets of 12, to really build in that trunk stability and muscle memory. It's a great exercise. A lot of people can't do rollouts, I know I can't, but with band assistance, man, I can do them and so can you. present drill once again one it start with red player number one he skates like this and he resize the pass from the player number two now he plays the pass here down he looks for a free space and he resize the pass back and he shoots after he shoot it defender plays him a pass he plays him a pass and he starts he resets the pass back. Now what we want to see, defender or forward num number one skates over, defender skates like this and he plays a pass like this to the player number five and he resets his pass back. Now we have player number five in the front of the net, shot. Defender goes backwards, forward skates like this, and he resides a pass from the player number six, and we have here beautiful situation once again one. Now we have next drill, once again one, defender num number one plays a pass to the forward num number one, he skates like this, forward backwards, he resides a pass, and he takes a shot. After this, he goes behind the net, he has some pucks, player number three starts like this, he receives this pass. Now, player number one skates like this, and he receives a pass. After this situation, what we wanna see, we wanna see player number one going on the defender number four from the other side. After is this drill done, the forward takes a puck behind the net, he takes a puck, he goes with puck. This forward skates in the front of the net, he plays a pass and he shoots. That's the next drill, once again one. Next drill is two against two. The player num number two in the corner, the red one, plays a big pass or sh should it pass on the defender. And now we have options. This player can 
for example, skate like this. He can play the pass on the player number one. Or of course, he can play the pass back on the D. Both players in the front of the net and shot. Now, what we wanted, we have two options. Of course, we can skate right now two against one on this side. Or we can do it so that this defender goes backwards on the blue line. Now he can receive a pass from this group. He can go behind the net. We can bring these players down. Cross. Look for a free space. Maybe pass here, pass back, pass here. And we have here another D on this side and we have two against one as soon as it's done here is a D D in the front two forwards here he receives a pass and he shoots next trail that I'm gonna do tonight will be that one that defenders on both sides goes and takes a shot they take a shot defender goes like this defender goes goes like this now the red player number one plays a pass on the D he goes like this players player number two goes like that he can play to him now we have two players going two against one as soon as they go defender is here and this forward goes once again one so we have two against one and once again one after was it done it should be very very quickly defender takes a puck behind the net this forward skates like this and he receives a pass now here is done they go on this side, defender goes in this side, now forward plays to this, defender he can play to him or to him, and now we have three forwards going three against one, it's done, the job is done, now defender in the front of the net, two players, one forward takes a puck, place a pass on this D, he takes a shot and it's all. It's very creative drill, once one, two one and three against one plus defender. The final drill that I'm gonna show you is drill two against one and three against one that we are gonna do tonight. Defender number one comes with a puck and he takes a shot. After he took a shot, he goes here, now we have here forward starting, he plays a pass, they just cross, beautiful situation, two against one, very quickly one. After that, defender goes this way, and we have here in, in the zone, three against one, as soon as it's done, the forwards skates this way this way this way of course a lot of creativity a lot of speed and now defender comes with a puck like this he's got of course options he can play pass to him he can play it back they can cross they can change the sides he can play it here he can play it here doesn't matter and we have here three against one. Don't forget, we need creative players. You are creative coaches. And let the players be creative because we want to see the players' creativity in the game. Thank you very much and I wish you very nice practices.
welcome to Talking Hockey with John and Howie. Here to bring you the latest on what's going on around the NHL and whatever else we want to talk about. Howie, um, today we're going to kind of just kind of go through the division real quick and talk about, about the trade deadline coming up, which is on uh, February 26th, and uh, maybe what teams we should expect to see some moves or maybe teams that we think should make moves. Yeah. Uh, let's start in the Atlantic. Uh, my opinion, I think who really needs to make some move, I would say it would be Montreal. They need some kind of a shakeup in that organization right now because I don't know what's going on. I agree. Um, I, think Mo- I think we should see some things come out of Montreal or some changes happening there. Um, another one, I think, too, is Detroit. Yeah, because yeah, Detroit. Yeah, I'd say Detroit. They're still kind of in that keep them rebuilding stage thing. I don't know exactly how that works, right. but I agree. But yeah, I think Montreal though would will probably be the most active for that division. Right. Over to uh, the Metropolitan. Metro- Metropolitan. I think uh, after what I've been reading, I think the Rangers are going to probably be the most active in that division, from what I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. So we'll see if that plays out true. I agree. Uh, Rangers uh, really need a boost right now. They they've been kind of playing mediocre hockey, and uh, if they want to be up uh, in that uh, playoff spot, they're going to have to do something. So. Yeah. I agree. Yep. Over in the West, uh, Central. Um, I think Minnesota here. Uh, I I. See, I, I don't know. I don't know. With Minnesota, I don't I don't know how active they will be. I mean, for them, I could, I could lean kind of towards Chicago, but, I mean, they're pretty solid. They're just, I don't know, they're just not melting together this year or what. But I think probably the most active, I would probably say, would be Colorado. I, I think they're going to try and continue on the – up path that they're currently on and see if they could maybe add a, a thing here or two and tweak it to just improve them that much they, more they better. They have been playing some awesome hockey lately and yeah. have found themselves back in the hunt for this. So, yeah, I think for that division, I'm, I'm thinking Colorado will probably be the most active. And over in the Pacific, I, I, I think in... Uh, I'm not trying to be biased or anything, but I think it should be L.A. Uh, I, well, yeah, I, I think it's going to, for me, I think the most active is, uh, it's going to be one of two, either Edmonton or LA, L.A. I think those two will probably be the most active out of that division. I think it I, should be L.A. Um, just because they're aging, I'd like to see yeah. some uh, youth in that team. Yeah. You know, Quick's not getting any younger. <laughs> no. But, I mean, right now, I mean, luckily, I mean, they got Kemper to, you know, Kemper's a good, solid, young goaltender backup right now. I mean, they could, you know, if they, they keep him and he could be, one of these days, I mean, very easily replace Quick if Quick has to be out or retire or whatnot. Right. Right. So, um... Who else? Ed, you said Edmonton. Edmonton, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, moves happen there either. Um, they, yeah. they definitely need something. All right, so I guess that's it for this week. Uh, we will catch you all next time for Talking Hockey with John. Huh? We did you all. Uh, I do. I do. This programming is brought to you by Local Video Magazine.